Hello, welcome to our webinar titled Introduction to the Great Loop. My name is Kim Russo. I'm the director of America's Great Loop Cruisers Association, and I am going to spend about the next hour walking you through this introduction to the Great Loop. We are going to cover some of the basics, including some of the most frequently asked questions about the Great Loop and some Great Loop statistics. I will also take you on a brief overview of the Great Loop route itself, and I will do that primarily using pictures that have been submitted by our members. So sit back and get comfortable, and we hope you enjoy this webinar. One of the most frequently asked questions about the Great Loop is what is the best boat for the Great Loop? Um, and that's a very difficult question for us to answer because unfortunately that depends. And it depends on a lot of things um, because it's a very personal decision on what the best boat for the Great Loop is. Some things to consider before you choose a boat for the Great Loop are your lifestyle and your needs. For example, uh, the conventional wisdom used to be that you should do the Great Loop in the smallest boat aboard which you and whoever will be joining you can be comfortable for the time you plan to take, generally about a year, to do the Great Loop. Um, over time, though, uh, people have been looking a little bit more closely at making sure that they have the creature comforts that they're looking for, and that has brought the trend towards larger boats. Smaller boats can be easier to handle, particularly in unfamiliar waters, which most much of the Great Loop will be for everyone. Um, but of course, if you have a bigger boat, you can have more stuff with you, you can have more people with you, and you can just be more comfortable along the way. So it really has to be a balance of your needs versus your wants and your lifestyle. There are some size restrictions on the boat and um, we'll talk about that in a little bit more depth shortly. Um, but uh, the, the biggest piece to remember is that there is a fixed bridge outside of Chicago that's currently charted at 19.6 feet. So you need to be able to get under that. Um, a draft of five feet or less is recommended. So those are probably the two key pieces of information. Um, continuing on with our frequently asked questions, how much will it cost is uh, generally asked quite frequently. Unfortunately, once again, that depends largely, again, on your lifestyle and your needs. For example, do you eat out frequently or do you prefer to eat at home? That's probably going to affect your choices as you're doing the Great Loop. Not too much about your lifestyle or um, your preferences, I should say, are really going to change very much just because you're living aboard a boat instead of on ground. So if you're somebody who likes to eat out a lot, that's probably going to continue, and particularly since you'll be in new areas with the um, access to trying lots of new restaurants. Um, Another factor maybe to consider, just as an example of your lifestyle, do you enjoy a lot of company or do you prefer solitude? If you're someone who's really a people person and you enjoy time spent with others, then you're probably going to find yourself pulling into marinas more frequently than anchoring out. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, another question, are you really comfortable on the water? Um, if not, you may find yourself pulling into marinas again much more often. Most of our members do find that the cost for marinas is their largest single line item. Um, and of course, the cost for marinas is also dependent on the size of the boat you choose. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Most marinas will charge by the foot. Some expenses are really not going to change too significantly. Things like medical and food, um, obviously you have to eat regardless of of whether you're on the water or not. Some additional costs to consider, of course, if you're buying a boat specific to the Great Loop, you, that may come with a payment. Um, your insurance for your boat, um, even if you already had a boat and insurance, the insurance may need to change for the Great Loop. And of course, you do need to factor in some repair money for the boat into your budget. Um, even if it's a new boat, you're probably going to want to budget for some maintenance. Fuel costs is generally one of the top line items. Of course, that's highly dependent on the boat you choose as well. Um, and I've already mentioned that marina costs play a role in that. Third frequently asked question, can we really do this? The first two questions, I hear them quite frequently, and those are basically um, kind of technical questions, more of a how-to question. When I hear this third question, to me, it is often um, I hear ha apprehension there. Um, some people are concerned about having the skills to do the Great Loop. I can tell you it's not a very technically challenging trip. It's not an ocean crossing where you're out um, in the middle of the ocean without access to services. 
um, the voting skills you need, even if you have not voted before, are pretty easily obtained in most areas of the country. Um, you can take safe voting courses and navigational courses, um, and just about everything you need from local power squadrons or Coast Guard auxiliaries. Um, you can also hire professional captains to come aboard your own boat and give you the training that you need to be able to pilot it comfortably. So the skills are easily obtainable. Another apprehension sometimes is the thought of leaving family and friends behind. Um, a lot of loopers have children and grandchildren and weddings and graduations and all kinds of family events happening and they hesitate to leave that family behind. One of the really great things about the Great Loop Route is that if you look at the map there, you're never very far from land, which means you're never very far from access to a rental car or to an airport. So trips home are quite possible and usually not real costly either. So that gives some people a comfort level that they won't be missing those family events that, that are important to them. Um, a final question there is, can people really uh, adapt to the change in lifestyle? You can pretty well replicate your ground lifestyle on board, but one of the things that's different for many loopers is that some are undertaking this trip almost immediately after retirement. So not only are they adjusting to not working um, and to being with their significant other much more frequently, they're now adjusting to doing that in a pretty confined space. The best advice I can give you on that comes from some of our members who tell me that if you have a very strong relationship with your significant other, other, you'll come back from this trip with an even stronger relationship because you will have accomplished this and had this amazing experience together. On the other hand, they also tell me if you don't have a very strong relationship with your significant other, you may want to consider other forms of adventure for your retirement plans. So keep that in mind. I do like to stress that the Great Loop is a very high adventure but very low risk undertaking. Um, here's some stats here. Over 26,000 people finished the Boston Marathon in 2016. Um, and these are all other ways you could spend your retirement time and other adventures you could have. About 1,000 completed the Appalachian Trail, which I believe is about a third of the distance of the Great Loop. That stats from 2015. Um, 658 reached the summit of Mount Everest in 2013, and just under 100 successfully swam the English Channel in 2015. So if you look at those adventures and how many people completed them and then look at the Great Loop, less than 100 boats complete the Great, Great Loop each year. Uh, last year in 2015 it was actually only 76 boats that completed this. So a very unique adventure, um, very, a, a great accomplishment to finish the entire Great Loop route. I can also tell you on the flip side of that though, that in terms of risk, it is closer to a marathon. Um, at top level marathons, about 97% of the runners actually finish the marathon. The Great Loop would be close to that. I won't tell you that everyone who starts it finishes, but most of the people who choose not to continue are doing so um, not because they're miserable or not because something catastrophic happened, but because uh, they've decided to go on to other adventures or because they're having medical issues or something along that line. So it's a very safe trip. Um, only about 25% of the people who start the Appalachian Trail actually finish it, and the same goes for the English Channel. Um, doing the Great Loop is a very safe undertaking. All right, some of the basic stats of the Great Loop. You will go through approximately 15 states and provinces. There is a variable there simply because of the, your route choices. So, for example, in Lake Michigan. If you take the eastern side of Lake Michigan, you will never enter the state of Wisconsin. So that's the variability there in the states and provinces. As far as countries, um, you can do the Great Loop completely within the U.S. borders. Most people do not. Most people will do the U.S. and parts of Canada. Some will even cross to the Bahamas, so you can actually do a third country as part of your Great Loop, and that would be considered a side trip. At the minimum on the route choices, you will be going through 5,250 miles. Some of our members add side trips onto there and report that their loop trip is um, 7,000, 10,000. Um, you can go a great distance in this. Most people average about 6,000 miles. You will go through 100 plus locks, again, depending on your route choices, and we'll show you some of the more unique locks a little bit further into this webinar. Um, and we say 365 plus or minus days. Um, the loop has been done in as little as two months and as much as 12 years. You really need to make this trip your own. Choose the route choices that appeal to you. Take the amount of time that works for you. 
but traditionally the Great Loop has been a seasonal trip um, where people were kind of doing it all at once and if you do that it does generally take about a year if you spend some time stopping to see the sites. Um, part of the reason for that is it's a seasonal route. You want to be heading up the East Coast in the spring. You're kind of um, following the warmer weather north. A good rule of thumb is to be on the Chesapeake Bay in May, um, and that's primarily because you do not want to get to the New York State Canals too far ahead of June 1st. The canals may not be open yet if you arrive there too early, and that depends largely on the type of weather and the type of winter that area of the country has had. So that's just a general rule of thumb. The red lines on the map you see there represent summer. You're obviously going to want to spend summer on the northern parts of the route, and that would include New York, of course, and Canada and the Great Lakes. Another rule of thumb is to be in Chicago by Labor Day. More and more, I'm hearing loopers who are staying on the lake a little bit longer, and that is perfectly fine. The reason the rule of thumb is Labor Day is that the weather windows on the lake become fewer and fewer as you get further into the fall, particularly as you move into October. And by mid-October, a lot of the facilities on Lake Michigan will start to close down for the winter, so it may be harder to find marinas to tie up and fuel and other services like that. So you do want to keep that in mind as you're heading through Chicago and into the river system. Typically, you would spend the fall on the river system. Most insurance for loopers has a clause that does not allow them to proceed too far south during the peak of hurricane season. Often that's November 1st, sometimes it's November 30th. You really need to check your specific policy and that point is also variable depending on the policy, but generally um, you will be stopping somewhere in Alabama to wait for the time frame when your insurance allows you to proceed farther south. So that's kind of another reason you don't want to rush off of Lake Michigan and then have to wait in Alabama for a time frame. So that's a balance you're going to want to strike and there are plenty of side trips to do along the river system if you're running a little bit ahead of schedule for your hurricane insurance. So something to keep in mind. Most loopers will spend the winter in Florida. Um, often going to the Keys and some will cross to the Bahamas. Um, you can start anywhere on that route and the time frame at which you would start is dependent on from where you're starting. So if you're starting from Charleston, South Carolina, you would start in the springtime and head north. The loop is generally done counterclockwise so that you can take advantage of the currents in the river system. It has been done in a clockwise direction, um, it does take more fuel and more time to buck the currents all the way up their river system. So that's something to keep in mind as well. We are seeing more and more people doing the Great Loop in segments, meaning that they boat for a few weeks, a few months, whatever their time frame is. Um, then they leave the boat, return home to take care of business, family needs, whatever that might be. Uh, so some people are looping just in summers. Some people are uh, looping for a few weeks and then going home for a few months. It's really up to you. One of the advantages of doing it in segments, though, is that you have plenty of time to plan the next segment while you're returning home. You also are not locked into hitting some of these rule of thumb time markers. For example, you could spend an entire summer on the Chesapeake Bay and not see all of the nooks and crannies there. So if you're looping in segments, you've got the advantage of being able to do just that, spend the whole summer in a specific area. Um, if you're doing the all at once trip and you need to be all the way through Canada during the summer months, then you really can't um, spend a lot of time on the Chesapeake Bay because you need to keep moving so you can get through the Great Lakes and out through Chicago before the cold weather hits. So lots of options there. Again, we just stress that you really need to make it your own trip and do it in a way that speaks to you. All right, I'm going to start with the tour of the route itself. Um, we are going to show you one boat's route just simply because of the time frame available to us today. I will point out the major route choices along the way, but we're going to start in Florida. Florida is a very popular place to start the Great Loop, um, primarily because there are a lot of boats there. So if you don't have your looping boat yet, it's fairly common to find one and purchase it in Florida and then start the loop from there. Florida's got more boats than any other state. Um, you'll be on the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway on the east coast of Florida, heading north. Um, Florida, of course, because there are so many boats and so much water, is just immersed in the boating culture, so you'll find plenty of services, plenty of things to do um, along the water. Very common for dolphins to play in your wake and kind of escort you through the waterways all through Florida and into the Carolinas. So that can be a pretty exciting sight for people who are used to boating in more northern 
areas or who haven't been boaters in, in most of their lifetime. Um, seeing the dolphin for the first time is a pretty unique experience that a lot of people get excited about. Um, this particular lighthouse is the Ponce de Leon Lighthouse outside of Daytona Beach. It was first lit in 1887 and the kerosene lamp could be seen from about 20 miles away um, at that time. That uh, original um, structure I believe has been um, upgraded and, and maintained so that it's still a working lighthouse. Um, as you continue north, you, the waterways in Florida start to become a little more pristine, um, different from South Florida where you see a lot of high rises along the water. As you get towards St. Augustine, it will become much more of a natural landscape like you see here. That is the St. Augustine Light and Museum. It was a Spanish watchtower built in the late 1500s. Um, that structure is no longer there, but it, that was the predecessor to the current St. Augustine Lighthouse. That is the oldest aid to navigation in North America. It was Florida's first lighthouse, uh, which was lit in 1824. And you can actually tour that lighthouse. Uh, there are 219 steps it takes you to get to the top. Also outside of uh, St. Augustine is the Castillo de San Marcos. This is the oldest masonry fort in the continental US. It was built in the late 1600s by the British. Um, they were building it to defend themselves against the Carolina, um, I'm sorry, it was built by the Spanish, um, and they were building it to defend themselves against the British who were in the, in the Carolinas and the Georgia colonies. Um, it was finished around 1695, and that it, you can tour that there in St. Augustine. The next major city you will come to is Jacksonville, so that's a good place to provision um, and get any maintenance that you might need along the way. That's also where a side trip up the St. Johns River would start from. Um, and that is a great side trip that takes you back to some natural springs that m remain a constant temperature all year round because of the springs bubbling up from the ground. Um, and because of that, it's a haven for manatee in the winter months where they're going to look for warmer water. So lots of wildlife you can see on that side trip. It's definitely something that um, many loopers recommend. Continuing out of Florida and into Georgia, um, Georgia and the Carolinas is an area where many loopers are concerned about shoaling. Um, there is a lot of shoaling in these areas and there is a big tidal swing. Um, the difference in tides through Georgia and the, the Carolina, so South Carolina can be um, seven to eight feet between high and low tide. So you really want to keep an eye on your tide tables. Uh, make sure you know what the tide is doing. If you have a deeper draft you want to make sure that you're traveling at a mid to rising tide so that you don't inadvertently go aground. Um, if you do, the bottom here is generally um, very sandy, uh, pretty soft. Um, if boaters in these areas tell you they've never run aground, they're probably not being quite honest with you. Um, I myself have spent a couple of uh, weekend days aground in Charleston Harbor waiting for the tide to come back so that you can get off of a sandbar. So it happens, um, but this area is definitely um, navigable for the Great Loop. Um, so keep that in mind and don't, as long as you keep an eye on the tides, you'll be fine. Um, the picture there is Cumberland Island National Seashore. Um, what you can see behind the trees there are wild horses that are there on the island. Um, the story is that the island um, was originally privately owned and at the time that it was turned over from the family that owned it to the government to become a national sea seashore, one of the requirements uh, that the landowners put on the, the deal was that their animals be allowed to remain on the island. Um, so there are wild horses there on Cumberland Island, which is a pretty neat thing to see from your boat. Continuing into South Carolina, um, this is pretty typical of what you'll see through the low country of South Carolina. That photo is from Hilton Head, um, which is kind of a golf and tennis mecca. So if those are, are some of your sports, that's probably a, a must-see stop for you. Continuing on, you will reach Charleston, South Carolina. That's a picture of the historic homes on the Charleston Battery there. And Fort Sumter is right there in Charleston Harbor. You can actually dock there uh, free of charge and tour the island from your boat. Um, Fort Sumter, of course, is where the first shot of the Civil War was fired um, by Confederate troops at the Union troops. Um, so it's something you can certainly explore. As you follow the Intracoastal Waterway around the Charleston Peninsula, you are be con continuing north, and this is kind of a typical picture of what the low country looks like, lots of soft sandy bottom, shallow water. Um, you will approach Georgetown, South Carolina, which is an historic mill town. 
prior to the Civil War, Georgetown exported more rice than anywhere else in the world, and it actually accounted for about 50% of the U.S. rice crop. The ICW gets a little bit busier in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. That's a typical bridge going over the ICW there. There's lots of, um, Myrtle Beach is a beach town, so there's lots of shopping, dining, um, shows, lots of golf and tennis, so a lot to do there if you are into a typical beach town. Continuing into North, of Carolina, North Carolina, you're of course in for some more beautiful scenery. Um, this photo was at Bald Head Island, and, and all through this area, and all through the loop in fact, there are plenty of opportunities to buy fresh fish from fishing boats like you just saw in that picture. Um, and this picture is actually, um, was submitted by one of our members, uh, the ICW in North Carolina, and some markers there. The first uh, place where you're really going to want to keep an extra close eye on your weather is crossing Albemarle Sound in North Carolina. So if you've started from Florida like we did in this example, um, this is kind of your first larger open body of water that is uh, subject to uh, some waves and things like that and some winds if the weather is stormy. So keep an eye on, on the weather before going through this area. Um, and of course, if the weather is not suitable, just stay put until things clear a bit. On the North Carolina-Virginia border is a route choice to go through the Great Dismal Swamp Canal. There's a picture of it there. Um, some estimates place the size of the original swamp here at about a million acres. What was remaining of it, which was only 50,000 acres, was donated as a wildlife refuge in the 1970s. So it went from about a million acres to 50,000 acres, and that was after centuries of logging and other human intervention that um, affected the swamp's ecosystems. This is actually an historic canal because George Washington first visited the area in 1763, and he and a few others founded the Dismal Swamp Company, which was a venture to drain the swamp and clear it for settlement um, and also to harvest the timber. Um, so the canal through there is an historic canal. It, the, the swamp itself is known for the very black water that you can see in that picture, which is a very reflective surface, so it leads to some very beautiful pictures. The black surface on the water is actually coming from tannin that's running through the cypress trees in the swamp. Um, so it's a, a very pretty sight, and as you come through the Dismal Swamp, you will be arriving in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, Norfolk is a place where you can't help but notice the military presence, um, and it is a, a big coastal city, so there's lots to see and do there. Continuing up the I Atlantic ICW, um, well, mile zero is actually at Norfolk, but you're considering continuing on intracoastal waters up through Maryland, um, through the Chesapeake Bay, and of course, as we've already mentioned, there's lots to see on the Chesapeake. You can spend a lot of time there, but if you are Sticking with the seasonal schedule, you do have to continue moving through so you can reach New York at the appropriate time. That is the Ship John Shoal Lighthouse off of Cape May, New Jersey. Um, it actually had 12-hour watches at that lighthouse until 1973 when it became automated, and it was sold as surplus by the government in 2012 for just $60,000, so kind of an interesting thought there. The New Jersey coastline is one of the places that many loopers will choose to go on the outside into the ocean rather than continuing on intracoastal waters. The intracoastal waterway through New Jersey is usually navigable. It takes some local knowledge and there can be a lot of shoaling and, and, and skinny water, if you will. Um, so many of our members will go on the outside here. It's really not a challenging thing to do because there are plenty of inlets that you can tuck into if you don't want to do the whole trip from Cape May, which is the southernmost port, port, point in New Jersey, to New York Harbor in one day. So you can stop at Atlantic City, and there are plenty of other inlets that you can tuck into and spend the night before continuing. This picture is from Manasquan Inlet, and that's probably your last stop before coming to what many people say is one of the highlights of the Great Loop, and that is entering New York Harbor and um, taking photos with the Statue of Liberty aboard your own boat. And one of my favorite looper quotes of all time came from Chuck and Jackie Craig. Um, they said, entering the New York Harbor when the sun broke through the overcast skies made the Statue of Liberty in Manhattan shine so brightly it took our breath away. Um, this is really a highlight for people. It's very common to try and arrive at the Statue of Liberty with a buddy boat so that you can take pictures of your friend's boat in front of the statue and they can do the same for you and that's, that's how this picture you're seeing came to be. Um, New York is also a place where you'll probably spend the most for dockage on the Great Loop. It's generally about $4 a foot, 
We do have a harbor host in New York City, and harbor hosts are other loop, loopers, other members of AGLCA, who volunteer to assist their fellow members when they're coming through their hometown. And harbor hosts are there to assist you with recommending services, recommending restaurants, telling you how to get around. Um, some of them will invite you to their home for a meal or bring you a welcome bag at the dock. Uh, phenomenal group, and they are extremely helpful. And as I mentioned, we have one in New York City who is a member of the Great Kills Yacht Club, which is on Staten Island, one of the boroughs of New York. And he gets our members into his yacht club for about $2 a foot. So he's a great person to contact when you're approaching New York if you're looking for some discounted um, places to tie up. And then he can help you with figuring out the transportation system in New York, which is, of course, a great public transportation system since it's such a large city. So lots to say and do in New York. As you wrap up your time there and you are leaving the city itself, you're going to be on the Hudson River. That's the George Washington Bridge you would head under. And as you go up the Hudson River, there's a pretty um, stunning scenery change from what you were seeing in the cannons of Wall Street a few days earlier. That is a full-scale replica of the ship that Henry Hudson used to explore the Hudson River. Um, you'll see cliffs like this along the Hudson River, and as you continue north, you will come across the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, which is what you see on the shore there. Um, West Point actually has a museum you can tour. It's obviously one of the finest collections of military memorabilia around. Um, and the cadets actually have parades on some weekends in the spring. So check your time frame as you're going through there, and that's a great place to stop and do a tour. This here is Polypel Island. The structure you see that looks somewhat, somewhat like a castle was built by um, a Scottish immigrant. It's known as Bannerman's Castle, and Mr. Bannerman was a military surplus munitions dealer. And he was looking for a safe place to store live munitions in close proximity to New York. Um, so he bought this island. It's about 50 miles north of New York City, and that is where he stored his live munitions. He built the castle there to kind of remind himself of the castles back home in Scotland, and there are tours available of Bannerman's Castle as well. That is St. Alphonsus Seminary. Um, it's a huge brick seminary built between 1904 and 1907. Today it is used as a high school. The Hudson River has some um, very characteristic lighthouses like this one, which is nicknamed the Maid of the Meadows. Most of the lighthouses you'll see in this area are that square shape, um, not the round spires that you see in some other parts of the country. Um, that one is the Rondout Lighthouse, which is um, the original lighthouse was built in 1867 and uh, was then replaced in the 1950s, which is kind of the case with several of these lighthouses. Um, that one is the Hudson Athens Lighthouse, and it was actually manned until the 1950s, at which point it was automated. But it does still today serve as an aid to navigation. This is an area where you will have one of your major route choices. You can either turn into the Erie Canal and continue on to Lake Ontario, Ontario that way, or into Lake Erie, or you can uh, turn into the Champlain Canal and enter Canada through what's known as the Triangle Loop. So we will show you those examples, and a lot of your choice there is going to depend on the clearance on your boat. So this is where air draft is going to come into play. I mentioned earlier that there is a bridge outside of Chicago that is the lowest unavoidable structure on the Great Loop. It's currently charted at 19.6 feet. There's no way around that bridge, so you need to have a boat that is capable of getting under 19.6 feet. Um, some of our members can accomplish that by removing antenna, sometimes radar arches. Um, obviously, sailboats would need to unstep the mast. Um, so many of them will do so actually in New York and then uh, restep them in Mobile Bay because that's really the next place past the 19-foot bridge in Chicago that they will be able to do much sailing. If 19 feet is about the lowest bridge that you can get under, then your route is pretty well chosen for you. You're going to take the Erie Canal from this point and then turn kind of northwest into the Oswego Canal, which will take you into Lake Ontario, and you will enter Canada that way. If, however, you can get under a 17-foot bridge, then the triangle loop opens up for you. Um, and that's where you would take the Champlain Canal through Lake Champlain and enter Canada that way. And you will be going through some of the historic Canadian canals, the Richelieu River, the Rideau Canal, um, and some of the historic Canadian cities like Ottawa, 
um, and Quebec. So you'd be coming through there in the summer. Uh, these are cities with very European feels to them, lots of street festivals, lots of things happening in the summer. Uh, and some very unique locks in that area. So many, many of our members who can get under 17 feet really enjoy that as their route choice through this area. The third choice, if you can clear a 15-foot bridge, is to take the Erie Canal all the way to its western terminus in Lake Erie. And then most people would turn into Lake Ontario and continue that way. If you are trying to do the loop staying completely in the U.S., then you would take this route and then continue through Lake Erie um, around Michigan. But the western part of the Erie Canal is really the more historic part. So we have had people who choose their loop boat very specifically to be able to clear a 15-foot bridge and do the western part of the Erie Canal. For this example, um, in the interest of time today, we are just going to go through the 19-foot route. So we're going to be taking the Erie Canal to the Oswego Canal into Lake Ontario that way. So continuing on, um, this house doesn't have a whole lot of sin historic significance, but it's just got kind of an interesting story. It's known as Lenrock. It has 34 rooms, including a five-story glass elevator, um, underground garage for 20 cars, a helicopter pad, 24-carat um, gold gilded ceilings. Um, Lenrock is actually Cornell spelled backwards, and it was built by someone in the insurance industry who was a Cornell alum. Um, Unfortunately, he was convicted of thefts related to his business, and in 2009, this mansion, along with the 11 acres um, of land along the Mohawk River, was sold for less than $2 million. Um, unfortunately, the people who bought it were then also convicted of a crime. Um, they were convicted of harboring an illegal alien right there in that house. Um, so the last time I checked, the government was actually trying to seize the house because that was a place where a crime had been committed. So who knows, that may be up for sale again at a bargain price. So on this route that we're taking, we are going through the Erie Canal. Much of the Erie Canal in this area is actually part of the Mohawk River. Um, there's a very strong Amish influence in this area, and there are lots and lots of small towns along the way. Uh, which makes for some very pretty scenery. This is Oneida Lake, which is another a small town. Um, Sylvan Beach is in this area. Populations of less than a thousand in many of these towns. Um, Oneida Lake is actually the largest lake completely within the borders of the state of New York. As I mentioned, you would turn northwest into the Oswego Canal, which will bring you out to Lake Ontario. In Lake Ontario, um, it's worth a trip to the Thousand Islands, which is at the mouth of the St. Lawrence Seaway. Those who took the Triangle Loop into Canada are going to be coming out this way. Um, and those who are in Lake Ontario, like I said, it's, it's a great um, time to take a little bit of an ex exploratory view at the Thousand Islands because there's a lot to see and do there. This is a picture of Bolt Castle. It was built um, beginning in 1900. It was going to be the largest private home in the U.S. at the time. He was building it as a gift for his wife. Um, however, he stopped construction very abruptly in 1904 when his wife unexpectedly passed away. So for about 75 years, the structures were left to just kind of decompose and to um, be exposed to the weather and even to vandals. Uh, but in the last several years, a great um, refurbishment has taken place on the property, so it can be toured. Um, you can dock private boats there, and it's really um, a, a great stop to check out Bolt Castle there. That is actually um, known as the Shell Room at Bolt Castle. That was going to be kind of the playground for adults. It was going to be where there was dancing um, and a bowling alley and billiard rooms and libraries and all that kind of thing. That's a picture of it um, in its dilapidated state. It has since been um, restored. So again, another great thing to see there. The Thousand Islands border and straddle the U.S.-Canada border. So it's a little bit difficult to see in this picture, but right between those two islands, there's a small footbridge that you can go over. And a popular story was once that that was the shortest international bridge in the world because one of the islands was in the U.S. and one was in Canada. Uh, I think uh, more modern GPS technology has kind of debunked that myth, uh, but it's kind of a cute story and it's um, very characteristic of what you'll see in this area of the Thousand Islands. Uh, this is the Sister Island Lighthouse, which was built in 1870. It's unique because of its dark gray limestone, but that was local material there in the Kingston, Ontario quarries. So that's what was used. Uh, but there are lots and lots of um, 
homes and things to see in the Thousand Islands. Um, it was actually a playground kind of for the rich and famous in the early 1900s. So definitely recommended to take the time to go through there before entering the Trent Severin waterway. And the Trent Severin is uh, known as one of the highlights for many people as well. It's a very interesting um, canal. It's actually a linear historic site for the country of Canada. It was initially used for industrial transporta and transportation purposes, um, but today it's maintained just for recreational boating and tourism. Um, good news for those of you headed that way is that in 2017, lockage in this area will be completely free, and that's a celebration that they're having and providing that to tourists. Um, that is a church on one of the islands. It's called St. Peter's on the Rock. It's 100 years old, and it was built just for this small lake community. It's accessible only by boat only open in summertime, um, and it was actually built near the intersection of Hell's Gate and Devil's Elbow, so great place for a church. The Trent Severin is also where you'll find some of the more unique locks on the Great Loop. This is the Peterborough Lift Lock. It's got a 65-foot change in elevation there. It's the highest lift lock in the world. Um, it works like um, a counterbalance scale, like a hydra hydraulic scale, so the upper chamber will be filled with just an additional foot of water, which makes it heavy enough to change the balance, and that chamber will start moving down while the other one is forced up. Um, so we'll kind of uh, time-lapse photography here and give you a look at what that looks like while it's in progress. So a very unique lock. Um, this is a picture of some looper boats entering the lock. And that is a picture of one of our loopers at the, the top of the chamber. Another very unique lock on the Trent Severin is the Big Shoot Marine R Railway. This is lock number 44 of 45. Um, and this is very unique because they decided it was less expensive to build this marine railway to transport boats over a road um, than it would be to dig a waterway there. Um, so once again, we'll kind of show you a time-lapse photography. Um, but what happens is the boats drive into this, what just looks like some piers there, um, but there's actually a sling underwater that the boats are lifted up by the sling. and the whole contraption moves out of the water and carries them over that spot of land. Very, very unique lock. Very interesting to see it happening. Um, this is a picture of a looper boat suspended in the straps there. And you stay on your boat while this is happening. Um, so kind of a, a thrill ride for you as well. And that's another picture of one of the looper boats in the railway contraption itself. And that is kind of the view. And you can see there how it's like a railway with a track that it runs on. That is the view down the hill that they're lowering you and back into the water. So a pretty a pretty unique, as I said, um, lock and, and certainly one of the highlights for many people. At the end of the Trent Severn, you will have reached Georgian Bay, which is sometimes called the Sixth Great Lake. It's actually off of Lake Huron. Georgian Bay is kind of a sportsman's paradise. There are lots of places to anchor and kind of um, run around in your dinghy, lots of great fishing. Uh, lots of swimming, lots of hiking, lots of nature trails. There are national and provincial parks in this area. So it's a place where a lot of loopers like to spend some time anchored and just enjoying what the outdoors in Canada has to offer them during the summer. As you wrap up your trip on Georgian Bay, you will be returning to the U.S., often through Drummond Island, Michigan, which is on the Michigan Upper Peninsula. There's a custom station um, right on site at Drummond Island, so that is why it's a popular place. These pictures you're seeing here are um, from Mackinac Island. It's a very unique island there on the Upper Peninsula. No cars are allowed on the island, so all of the transportation is by horse and buggy or bikes, um, so definitely a unique stop. As you start your trip down Lake Michigan, you have to choose either the eastern or the western shore. These pictures are from the eastern side of Lake Michigan, so they're actually coming down the shore of Lake Michigan. Um, Lake Michigan obviously is a large body of water, and particularly on the eastern side, uh, because the winds are coming from the west and have had a chance to go across the lake, it can kick up some waves and some bad weather. The good news is Michigan has established some um, 
harbors of refuge, which essentially mean that those harbors take you, um, if you're having any kind of a mechanical problem with your boat or if there's bad weather, they have to find a place for you to tie up. And those harbors of refuge are every 30 miles along the Michigan coast. So you are never more than 15 miles away from one of those harbors of refuge. But lots of small fishing villages along the eastern side of Lake Michigan um, so lots of great things to see and do and lots of great stops there. Of course from this picture you can tell that you've arrived in Chicago. Chicago is a good place to provision for the upcoming trip down the river system because it's the last big city you're going to see for a little while. Um, obviously lots to see and do in Chicago. The architectural tour of the uh, Chicago River is highly recommended by loopers. You can take your own boat up the Chicago River if you can get under. I believe it's about 17 feet. Um, and that's also a great sight to see. Um, this is a picture that was sent to me of that 19.6 foot bridge that we've mentioned. That's the lowest fixed structure. So I thought I would share that with you. So you're going to take the Illinois River out of Chicago until you get to the Mississippi River. Um, the Mississippi River is um, uh, there's not, as you can see, you're passing St. Louis, so you're passing the Arch. It's a great place to take some pictures. There are no facilities along the waterway there in St. Louis, so if you want to visit that city, you do have to dock um, either before or after St. Louis and, and take a car to tour St. Louis. Um, this is also where you'll start to have a route choice. Most loopers do not continue on the Mississippi past Grafton, Illinois. Um, the reason being there are many fewer facilities on the lower Mississippi. Um, I believe it changes your fuel range from needing about 250 mile range to needing about 350 if you have diesel and about 450 if you have a gasoline engine. Uh, there's also a large amount of commercial traffic on the lower Mississippi. So most members will turn into the Ohio River um, at Grafton. And this is actually um, showing you parts of the Mississippi where the rivers come together and you can see the distinct differences in the color of the water. So it's kind of an interesting picture. Um, so most loopers will take the Ohio River to the Tennessee River, and that's where these pictures are coming from. Um, the Tennessee River, you are on this waterway in the fall, which is the perfect time to be there because you've got lots of hills and lots of fall colors. Um, so lots to see and do there. The Tennessee River in this area is also where you will come past the Shiloh National Cemetery. Um, a lot of loopers call this, you know, one of the most solemn and moving stops that they make along the Great Loop. The Battle of Shiloh was one of the first major battles in the Western theater of the Civil War. It was a two-day battle that involved about 65,000 Union troops under General Grant and about 44,000 Confederate troops. Um, the casualty number was 24,000 who were killed, wounded, or missing from this battle. And there's a national cemetery there. So, um, very solemn and moving place to stop. Shortly after that, um, if you continue on the Tennessee River, you will come to Joe Wheeler State Park in Rogersville, Alabama. That is the site of the AGLCA Fall Rendezvous. It is four days of seminars, of camaraderie, of touring other boats. Uh, lots of fun, definitely not to be missed. Um, that is usually in late October, so keep an eye out on our website for details about that. That picture is all looper boats in the lock leaving Joe Wheeler State Park. As you continue to the trip, you are going to be entering the Tentom Waterway, which is what makes this more eastern portion um, rather than the lower Mississippi possible. The divide cut is actually one of the largest um, projects ever un undertaken by the Corps of Engineers. It is a channel that is 29 miles long that was cut to connect the Tennessee River to um, the Ten Tom Bigby River, hence it's called the Ten Tom. Um, it, I'm told that it's one of the few man-made structures that is visible from space, so just a little fun fact for you there. You will go through several locks along the Ten Tom. This one is the Witten Lock, and it is the largest chain of, change of elevation on the Great Loop. It is um, 84 feet is the difference between the top and bottom of that lock. This is some of the more rural area you will go through on the Great Loop, um, and this is also the area where you may have to wait to continue south until hurricane season is over, but you will eventually arrive in Mobile, and that is the first large city you've really seen since Chicago, so that's usually a spot um, where you can stop and get any repairs done as you're preparing for the Gulf crossing. 
the gulf crossing is something that tends to give loopers a little bit of angst. Um, because many loopers are doing the great loop in a slower boat like a trawler, the gulf crossing is sometimes an overnight crossing. It's 170 statute miles from Carabell or Apalachicola to Tarpon Springs or Clearwater on the other side of the Gulf. Um, we do offer a full 90-minute seminar on this at our fall rendezvous, um, but you would calculate your normal cruising speed and determine how many hours it's going to take you. The objective is to leave in the afternoon, travel overnight so that you're in the middle of the Gulf where there's nothing to hit in the darkness, and then arrive on the other side on the west coast of Florida in the morning hours after the sun is above the horizon, so maybe around 10 a.m., and that's so you're not blinded by the sun and you can see crab pots as you're approaching land. Um, for many loopers, that might be a 20-hour crossing. For some who can travel faster, it can be done all in daylight. Um, keep in mind that we have never lost a looper boat. They all return. Um, it is something, it, it's very easy to find a buddy for the crossing, a buddy boat because you're waiting for a suitable weather window. That really is the key to the crossing, is just being patient and waiting for a day where the weather is suitable for you to cross. Um, so loopers start to kind of stack up and wait in Carabelle or Apalachicola, waiting for that weather window. So it becomes pretty easy to find some buddy boats to do the crossing with. We also have a volunteer, Eddie Johnson, who analyzes the weather patterns each morning and kind of offers his opinion of a, when a suitable weather window will occur. So we do have some resources to help you with the crossing. Um, and it usually, like I said, gives loopers some angst, but it is really um, one of the beautiful parts of the trip. Once it's finished, people are usually kind of sit back and say, well, that wasn't so bad. There is another option to take the Big Bend route, um, and that's where you kind of come in closer to the coastline. That requires, usually for most boats, um, about three days of good weather, so it can prolong the process of getting to the other side. Um, but it does give you an option if you don't want to do the overnight crossing. The longest hop for that is still a pretty long day um, from Carabelle to Steenhatchee. Um, I believe that's a 10 to 12 hour day depending on your speed. And then you'll probably have two more hops, one of which will require you to anchor in the Gulf. Um, so you do need a very good weather, weather window. And the other thing to keep in mind, even though it looks on the map like you're hugging the coastline, you're really not. You have to travel, because of the, the shallows there, you do have to travel um, many miles out into the Gulf. So lots of choices, and we do have resources for you to help you figure out what the best way for you to cross is going to be. Once you have crossed to the other side, you are arriving um, either in... Um, Clearwater or Tarpon Springs. Tarpon Springs is a Greek fishing village known for harvesting sponges from the Gulf, and that's what you saw on the dock there. Um, lots of great Greek restaurants, um, definitely a neat town to see. As you continue south, you are now in the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway. Um, so you're hugging the coast. If you're going out into the Gulf, you're coming in through passes in the evening, and uh, passes are called inlets on the East Coast, but in the Gulf we call them passes. Um, and one of the very popular places along the Gulf Coast of Florida is Fort Myers. Um, that's a haven for loopers. Many loopers spend the winter there. Um, Fort Myers is also a very popular place for whatever reason for loopers to settle after they're finished the loop. So we have lots of members who have purchased houses or condos in Fort Myers. And that's why we do um, some of our winter events there in Fort Myers. We have our Gold Looper reunion there. Um, and we also try to do some seminars for some of our newer members as well. So check our website for happenings, usually in mid to late January in Fort Myers, Florida. Fort Myers is also where the Okeechobee Waterway connects. So we started our trip on the Okeechobee. Um, that would close our loop if we um, did the trip in that pattern. The other option besides Lake Okeechobee is, of course, to go around the tip of Florida, and that would enable you to visit the Keys and spend some time there. Most loopers who are going to the Bahamas would jump off towards there from what's ca called the crossroads, and that's actually at the intersection of the Okeechobee Waterway and the Atlantic um, Intracoastal Waterway, which is around Stewart, Florida. So that's the path you would take for that side trip. Um, so that's a, a Bahamas side trip. We mentioned the St. Johns River outside of Jacksonville, which goes all the way to Sanford, Florida, and a um, very natural, pristine, uh, full of wildlife side trip. The Potomac River is a very popular side trip because it's not that long, but it does take you into the heart of Washington, D.C., and you can see the nation's capitals from the water, which is certainly a unique perspective. You can take the Ohio River all the way to Pittsburgh, 
as a side trip. That is many miles, um, but certainly worth doing. And then some popular side trips when it's fall and you may be waiting for the hurricane window to close so you can proceed to the Gulf. Um, the Tennessee River you can take to Chattanooga, um, which is popular, and the Cumberland River you can actually take all the way into Nashville and explore the Music City. And then finally, lots of side trips on the Great Lakes. Some of our members consider a circumnavigation of Lake Superior to be a side trip of the Great Loop. So lots and lots of options there. I have included my contact information here. I'm happy to answer whatever questions you may have about the Great Loop um, or to put you in touch with um, some resources if you need them. Thank you for watching this webinar. Um, again, I'm open to whatever questions you have, and you should be receiving a survey from us if you would please take a few minutes to answer that, it's very helpful for, for us to use that feedback as we're planning additional webinars. Thank you so much.